what I propose to do, I, I've got slides here, which only I can see, which is fine, because they're really just to give me a, a bit of a structure of, of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm very happy not to, to kind of, I mean, especially with such small numbers, to be interrupted and to make it as um, dialogical as we can, either as we go, or you can let me um, rattle on for a while and then we can stop and talk. Um, on the specific question of spirituality um, and faith, uh, I thought about this in advance, and um, so I, I I would call myself a person of faith, and I, I, I my own background uh, in that regard is in the Christian church. Um, but interestingly, in, although I'm an academic and I've studied philosophy and history and social work and sociology and criminology, I've never studied theology, so my kind of appreciation of questions, theological and spiritual, is lay. And for that reason, I thought I wouldn't try to insert my kind of lay understanding into the sort of academic content of the talk, but rather I'll, I'll keep it at a philosophical level where the connections to spiritual and theological questions will probably be quite easy to make. But I'm going to somewhat rely on you to help me make some of the connections to those those sorts of questions as we as we go through. I, I think that's easy to do because I think that for all that, that we have secularized our the way that we think about crime and, and punishment, in fact, even today, even uh, when we've changed the language, been influenced by the development of law and social science and, and whole uh, whole post enlightenment traditions of, of secularization. The fact is that spiritual questions and, and questions of belief, um, both kind of in the sense of what I would think of as deep structures of meaning and fundamental questions about uh, humanity and society are unavoidably contained in, in, in everyday practical dilemmas that arise in the justice system. So there's, there's literally no escaping. Um, the sort of existential and spiritual questions that lie behind crime and punishment. Um, so I'm very confident that we're going to make those connections, but I'm not going to make them on my own uh, as I go through this. So I'm going to start from a, a paper that I wrote for a book a, a year or two ago, which was, was given the title, What Good is Punishment? Um, and it was, it was linked to... Uh, a conference that took place a few years ago in England organised by the Howard League for Penal Reform, which was trying to get at an even more fundamental question, what is justice um, in the context of uh, criminal matters, criminal justice. Um, I, I reframed the question slightly, uh, and my, my reframe version of it was, what sort of good is criminal justice? Um, and then I, I kind of jumped from there. So here's here's where I began. <coughs> and this is, as is commonly the case with me with philosophy, in this case, the philosophy of John Rawls, who wrote a very famous book in the 1970s called A Theory of Justice. And one of my favorite quotes from him is that justice is the first virtue of social institutions, as truth is of systems of thought. So when it comes to thinking about the constitution of human society itself, the way that we order our affairs, uh, the way that we establish um, social institutions, justice is absolutely fundamental. Um, and indeed, is the, it's constitutive of the good society. There is no way of conceiving of a good society without justice being at its core. Rawls um, was speaking principally about distributive justice and social justice rather than criminal justice, but I think the principle applies in both contexts. The other way to think about justice, and criminal justice specifically, is to think about it as a productive good, so not as something which is good in itself or which is indicative of a good society, but rather as something that we must do in order to produce other benefits. Um, and that, that sense of it of justice as a productive good is, is, is wrapped up in a, a very common phrase, at least common to my ears, which is without justice, there is no peace. And that phrase recurs in relation to all sorts of social movements and uh, campaigns for global justice, in fact. Um, but I think there's a really profound truth in it, 
which is that if, uh, un unless we arrive at a shared understanding that the resolution of our, our, of our ills, whatever they are, is fair and appropriate, um, then we don't really settle conflicts that might arise between us. They remain unresolved, and that is disruptive of the social peace or the interpersonal peace between us. So if we can't find a resolution that to all parties feels just, then we're in some difficulty. And I think that sense of needing peace between people, peace between communities, peace between nations, um, gets to, it gets instantly to a, a very fundamental aspect of, of how human beings evolved, in fact, and of how we come to live together. Um, and the central idea here, which is endorsed, I, am under, I understand now by evolutionary scientists, uh, which is not my field, is that reciprocal social relations, so exchanges between people um, that, that, that enshrine certain reciprocities of respect one for another, um, those are fundamental to the cooperation on which human life depends. It's as serious as that. If we can't cooperate, um, if we can't accept each other's value, worth, dignity, um, then we can't begin to do things like trade or basically live together um, uh, without a set of reliable reciprocities in the ways that we relate to one another. Uh, we can only ever be on edge around one another. Um, literally armed and ready to defend interests that we can't rely on one another to respect. So to get past that is to establish a set of reciprocal social relations that allow us to live at peace. Um, offending, crime, that's why it's a problem fundamentally for me. And it's interesting that the word offence in the criminal justice system isn't generally thought of in this way, but actually the reason why offending is offensive is precisely because it, it represents a violation of reciprocal social relations. It means I can't trust you because you haven't abided by the implicit promise between us uh, to respect one another. And so we kind of immediately and, and sometimes too hastily make a swift move at this point to the idea that if a violation of those reciprocities has occurred, then we must sanction that we must censure it and sanction it. We can't allow that violation to stand because if we do, those reciprocal relations will atrophy and we'll find ourselves back in a nightmare. A kind of, you know, the Thomas Hobbes state of nature, yeah. red and tooth and claw, competing viciously for scarce resources, that sort of scenario. So we need to respond to wrongdoing. Um, because we have to try to find a way to sustain these reciprocities which constitute a just order of things. Um, a related point here is that when we sanction and censure, one of the most fundamental things that we're doing is communicating about our values. So we are affirming and expressing certain values, certain re reciprocities, and we're saying something about ourselves in the process. Um, we often talk about criminal justice as if it's an instrumental logic, like deterrence would be a classic example of an instrumental logic. But in fact, for me, it's much more fundamental than that. There's something visceral about the pursuit of justice. Um, it's so central to the project of human social life and so central to our sense of being recognized by one another that we can not reduce it to questions of cost-benefit calculations. Um, so to give you an obvious example, if I commit an offence um, and, it, and if a, a, a wise criminologist comes to you and says, I, I, I can absolutely guarantee you on the basis of irrefutable scientific evidence from randomised control trials that giving Fergus a month in the Ritz at the state's expense um, and some time off work will guarantee that he won't re-offend, you might still reasonably say, in what sense is that <laughs> justice? Um, but, but if you were a pure utilitarian, yeah. you would have no reason really to complain about that resolution because it would be crime reducing in everyone's collective interest and incredibly cheap by comparison with 
what we actually do when we uh, imprison. So it's not just about those calculative arguments, it's about something more fundamentally communicative. Second, an another sort of layer of complexity is that when we sanction, we exercise power um, because it's the state and the state's organs that sanction. And it can do it in two ways. It can do it in, a, in ways which are fundamentally negative or more positive. And I'll explain a bit more about these two forms in a moment. Um, what actually happens when we make those choices about the imposition of sanctions, that is an object of empirical inquiry. So criminologists and sociologists and others can and do study that. And what we find out then has normative consequences. Because if what we think we're doing produces outcomes that are at odds with those that we pursue, we should care about that. Yes. Yeah. What does normative mean? Well, sorry, normative means, um, and please do interrupt me if I um, uh, slip into academic habits. Um, normative just means relating to norms, so based on principle um, rather than evidence. But there's always a relationship between the normative, the principle, and the evidence. So if my principle is I, I could have a principle that we ought to deter crime, but if I then produce compelling empirical evidence that what we're doing is not deterring crime, then you 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 have a problem with the application of that normative principle. So we need to kind of keep the evidence and the principle in dialogue with one another to make sure that we're not doing things that are uh, counterproductive. Um, one of my uh, favourite Scottish in fact, one of my favourite full stop scholars of punishment is um, David Garland, who's a Dundonian, used to work at Edinburgh University, now at New York University. And recently he's kind of re-examined the work of the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, and he sums up Durkheim's position on punishment in this way. He says, the essence of punishment, Durkheim claims, is irrational, unthinking emotion driven by outrage at the violation of sacred values or else by sympathy for fellow individuals and their sufferings. So the kind of fundamentally what's going on in punishment according to Durkheim is expressive. It's value driven. Um, and the values are either uh, a sacred affront at the violation of God's law or under a, a more sort of modern uh, secular world, uh, what replaces sacred values is respect for individual rights. Um, so that becomes something that we hold sacred. And we kind of do in the way that we talk about human rights. So if a victim's rights are, are violated by an offender, then that evokes, and it should evoke, a profound and, and visceral reaction. And Durkheim's not criticizing us here. He's saying that's, that's right and that's normal. And that that's a sign that we have shared values that we, that we hold sacred. And we need those to have social solidarity. The question is, what do we do with them? How do we give vent to them and exercise them? Contrast that with another, um, an even earlier thinker, uh, Cesare Beccaria, who's, who's a, 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 a fundamental figure in, in the Enlightenment as it relates to questions of crime and punishment. And he says this in very flowery language, translated, I think, from the Italian. Would you prevent crimes? Let liberty be attended with knowledge. As knowledge extends, the disadvantages which attend it diminish and the advantages increase. Knowledge facilitates the comparison of objects by showing them in different points of view. When the clouds of ignorance are dispelled by the radiance of knowledge, authority trembles, but the force of the law remains immovable. So we need principles, we need evidence, we need science, we need law, we need the empirical, we need the normative. Okay, so that was a bit of background. Now I'm going to kind of drill down specifically into the question of punishment. Um, and a, a standard definition of punishment in liberal philosophy, which is the kind of guiding philosophy for the liberal democracies that, that we live in in the West, uh, goes something like this. Um, and there are three parts. Punishment is an intentional infliction of harm or hardship on a person. That's point one. So there's some kind of hard treatment. <clears throat> Two, that's imposed in order to reproach or censure that person for a criminal wrong that the person is found to have committed. So 
has to have that censure. Uh, it has to be for a criminal wrong, and it has to have been properly found through a due process that the wrong was committed by that person. And thirdly, it has to be inflicted by someone entitled to make that wrong his or her business and to perform the punishing act. So a legitimate authority has to be the punisher. And that, that definition comes from um, a Cambridge scholar called Anshit Dubois-Pedan, whose work I've been reading recently. Um, now, it's worth just pausing for a minute and thinking how odd this is. Um, th these three conditions are unusual in the societies that we live in because they're liberal democracies. So liberals, with a small L, prize individual liberty, autonomy, freedom of movement, self-interest, the right to pursue your self-interest, the right to hold your property. Those are the, the, the prized things uh, that the liberal subject is said to possess. And yet now we're seeing the state can trample all over that under these conditions. So it's important to remember that we can't usually inflict these harms on one another. That's against the rules. Um, but we can do it in this case because we're referring back to a wrong that's been done that must be communicated about um, and because the authority is lawful and legitimated. Um, that's, that's the argument. But the most interesting thing about uh, Dubois-Pedan's recent re recounting of this story is that she adds a fourth dimension which is usually missed. And this is the, this is what I really want to talk about. Um, and actually, I think this is where many of the connections that we might make to theology and spirituality really begin to come into play. Um, there's lots of religious texts, I guess, that deal with condemnation and justice in the sense of the need to find a remedy for a wrong. There's also, though, a lot of religious uh, texts and experience um, that relate to this fourth element. So here she says, as a general social practice, punishment does not merely mark out the punishee, the punished person's actions as wrong, and blame him for engaging in the wrongful act. It also defines how the punishee, the punished person, and the punisher will move forward from here. The penal agent, the one exercising the authority to punish, lays down the terms of his or her future coexistence with the offender in a shared social world. Because this is punishment's central social function. There is reintegrative momentum inherent in punishment that gives the offender himself an interest in being punished. Far from threatening or challenging an offender's membership in the community, punishment exists to reassert and reinforce it. So again, this is classic liberal philosophy, but the point is the way back from the wrong is to pay the debt. And with the debt settled, we are renegotiating living together. The reciprocities are restored because the harm is taken seriously, apologies offered, and remedy is provided. So this question of reintegrative momentum is absolutely at the heart of, of what I want to talk about. Sorry. Do, do any of those four points incorporate proportionality, as in the yeah. punishment shouldn't be too harsh yeah. either the seriousness? Yeah, indeed. And, and, and of course, that, yeah, that, if the punishment is excessive, then it violates the, so I'll go, I'll, I'll go back a step. Most liberals would say the first thing about punishment because it's such an unusual violation of the normally respected rights of the citizen, is that we must do it as little as possible. So that's parsimony. That's formally called parsimony. Second principle is proportionality, and it's linked. So that is that the punishment should fit the crime. And we, we tend to hear that statement, which is a biblically derived statement from the Lex Talionist, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We, we tend to hear that now as a statement in favour of severity. But actually, it's a limiting principle. What it's, what it's saying is no more, no more than, than the harm done is, is justified. So we can, we can aim to balance, but we certainly can't be um, uh, illegitimately excessive in, in the way that we pursue retribution. Um, so yes, proportionality is critically important. Now, so far, I've been kind of assuming a liberal philosophy, um, which, of course, 
I'm not even sure that I share it, so uh, I'll just put that out there. But even if you don't agree with Dubois Pedan's argument, it doesn't really matter. If you're a reductivist, if you want to reduce crime, you have to care about reintegration, because without it, there's an enormous amount of criminological evidence that if the person isn't integrated successfully, the likelihood of recidivism is increased. So there's no escaping it from a reductivist point of view. And if you're a retributivist, it follows from the proportionality principle and from the parsimony principle that you have to make the punishment end. If the debt is 10 years, then 10 years in one day is too much punishment. And ending punishment requires integration. If the person isn't restored to the cycling of the debt, then the whole, um, the whole kind of uh, metric that we're trying to establish in this approach fails. Um, I'm distracted by um, something that's been with me for a long time. That maybe I should just voice because yeah. it's it's distracting me. And that is legitimate anger to disenfranchise people. Mm -hmm. So if you have People who like Franz Fanon, the yeah, yeah, right yeah. to be angry when yeah. things have been unfair to a group of people like the yeah. Native, uh, the First Nations in in Canada, yeah. and okay, they're offending, and there's all sorts of programs to address, but they have had an unjust situation, yeah. and you might argue that blacks in America, yeah. they offend, yeah. but uh, so could you yeah, somehow sure. put that. Uh, well, I, I That's will. That's not what you're talking about, but yeah. I'm finding that I'm just thinking, yeah. what about... No, 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 you're quite right, and I, I couldn't justified agree... Justified I, I couldn't agree more, and um, I'll say something about it now, and then I'll come back okay. to it, because it, it yeah. fits into another part I of... I know it's not what you're saying. No, yet. no, but um, the, the, the big problem with the liberal model is that it assumes that what we're trying to do in punishment is restore a just social order. And if we don't have yeah. a just social order in the first place, then the application of these principles goes mm -hmm. awry. And that's that's a pretty <laughs> fundamental problem. There's a second problem, incidentally, which is equally troubling, um, which is a, is, is a more, more, one that I've only thought about more recently um, from listening to uh, Judith Butler give the Gifford lectures at the University of Glasgow this year. She's a, a gender studies uh, <coughs> scholar, <coughs> profoundly influential globally um, but the specific uh, point that she made in the lectures and this is getting quite philosophical so if, if let me know if this doesn't make sense to you but basically I mentioned Thomas Hobbes earlier and this idea of the liberal the liberal subject is a, a, a sort of rights bearing self-interested autonomous individual she mocks that idea uh, Judith Butler in, in her lectures and, and says why haven't we noticed that that subject is gendered and has a certain ethnicity. That is a white middle class property owning subject. And the kind of founding myth of liberalism is based around a certain conceptualization of the interests of a certain subsection of the population. And it's not an accident that it's those people that the system best defends. And that's part of the problem yeah, for, for the Black Lives Matter movement that uh, you know, I might I might want to rely on the state's exercise of its its authority to sustain and protect my interests, but that's because I can. Whereas if I'm a young African American man in a ghetto, you know, in name your American state, then I I don't have that protection, and the state isn't functioning in that way. Um, she makes a second point though, which is equally important, which is to say that the the idea of autonomy of the liberal subject of independence as something that we have and that we should strive to protect is also a fiction. Um, because we're all born, in fact, we're gestated in dependency and, and we are delivered into interdependency and we never move beyond that. So uh, she would therefore argue that, that what we need to pursue is a relational ethic of care, not the pursuit of individual interests of subjects protected equally under the law, which is the fiction. So I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't advancing this argument as a kind of 
<clears throat> somebody who's committed to liberalism philosophically, I'm trying to kind of, that, these are the principles that govern our system as it stands, so I'm kind of describing it in its own terms in order to tease apart some of its tensions. And as I go on, you'll see how these tensions recur and also maybe how, how we might have to work to redress them. Okay, so, so far we've got to the point, I think, where I've argued that whether you're a reductivist or a retributivist, whether you buy this um, liberal argument or not, you have to care about reintegrative momentum. You have to care about whether punishment brings people back in a better condition um, to live peacefully um, in the community, to live at peace in the community. Of course, if you're a criminologist or a sociologist who studies the penal system, you know that, in fact, reintegrative momentum is very hard to generate and very easy to lose. Um, and I, I, I could quote lots of studies that describe how that is uh, lost at the point of sentencing, lost in the way that we implement sentences, and lost in the way that we handle the ending of sentences, none of which I think we're particularly good at from the perspective of thinking about reintegration. There's a, there's a prior problem which, uh, which relates to why and when we choose to criminalise and penalise at all. So if when we seek to right wrongs, our purpose, our primary purpose is to secure relational reintegration, how should that influence the choices that we make about the, the way that we respond to wrongs? Um, so I asked my students this question today. Um, when somebody that you love wrongs you, what do you want to happen to them or for them? And what do you want from them? Let's just ask that, not as a rhetorical question. So think about, think about this in the context of people that you care most about in the world and that care most about you, but nonetheless, in some significant way, they wrong you. What, what do you want the, uh, the resolution of that wrong to look like or to involve? What do you will for that person? I would say that I would like, first and foremost, an acknowledgement by the person of their whatever act yep. was, an expression of regret about it, mm -hmm. and um, I won't do it again, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then let it go. Okay. However serious the wrong, or that, that would probably be the way I would deal with lots of minor wrongs. Well, I suppose, well... They tried to murder me, say, mm -hmm. something really serious. I guess I would think that that would be not totally for me to deal with. What would, it, it, actually, even going back to less serious wrongs, what would persuade you that the apology was real and sincere? I mean, persuade you to the extent that you were really able and willing to set aside the wrong. Well, obvious. Um, I would um, hope that it was sincere, mm -hmm. but only time would really reveal if it had been sincere. Mm -hmm. But I think that you, I would probably give the benefit. If I had doubt, I would give the benefit. Yeah. Any other thoughts or any other reactions? I would think that I would expect that person to show some kind of empathy, some kind of understanding of the effect. Mm -hmm. Whether it was just an emotional effect, say, that it had on me, I think mm -hmm. they'd done. And that would be part of understanding whether or not they were sincere. Yeah. If I had, if I thought that they'd understood mm -hmm. what it had done to me. Um, yeah. Also, I, I wanted to bring in, I suppose, a Christian idea of forgiveness as well into it. And you, was, mm -hmm. you used words like set aside. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you meant forgiveness there or not. Well, I, I don't know either. Okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe I do, um, and maybe forgiveness is not the setting aside um, so much as the working through. We often, we, in, in, criminal, in criminology, there's an interesting literature on the question of what we do with convictions, um, criminal convictions, um, and there are arguments there about what should be forgotten, like formally forgotten or forgiven, and what it is to seal the record 
and therefore treat the past as completely resolved to the extent that we no longer consider it to have happened almost. So we kind of try to rewrite the history. Um, I'm not sure whether forgiveness aims to go that far. I think for me, forgiveness remembers but doesn't hold against. Um, but maybe people have other conceptions of forgiveness. Like forgiveness if you don't if you have forgotten it? I, 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 forgiveness, I mean, forgetting can surely can't be chosen. Either you remember or you forget. Mm. I think it's the holding against that you, that you can perhaps do something about willfully. Um, but that's just my, this is, this is me traveling into lay areas where I don't claim to have any <laughs> particular expertise. So I had written here, to repair reciprocal relations, if we think about it in the context of those sorts of close relationships, we usually need apology, remorse, repair. Like, but we didn't mention that, but actually, one of the things that would, would convince me that, that an apology is sincere is if somebody actually tries to make good the wrong, if it's, if it's a recoverable wrong. So, you know, if they break my favourite guitar, which would be a gross offence in my house, <laughs> they might offer to buy me a new one. That could be a reasonable response as opposed to just saying, I'm sorry about your guitar, but hey, you've got another one, don't worry about it. I wouldn't, wouldn't regard that as sincere because it didn't take seriously my loss, not just the financial loss of, a, of, of the instrument, but what the guitar meant to me. Which... There's a big difference if the guitar was mistreated in a culpable way or whether yeah. it was an accident. It would. It would make a difference. So the, the and again the, the criminal law takes account of that in thinking about intentionality and blameworthiness and culpability or tries to, you know, admittedly in a clumsy way. What I think is is interesting, and this is the second question that I asked my students, if you if you respond that way to people who love you, why do you think we tend to respond differently to people who are strangers to us. In one sense, you could argue that if people who love us wrong us, we're entitled, we should, well, maybe that's too, too pejorative a, a comment, but we, we might be entitled to be more angry. Yeah. 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 So, so what is it that entitles us to, to, why do we reserve our punitiveness for strangers and uh, a kind of willingness to pursue this more sort of reparative route with Intimates, for want of a better expression. Um, and I think, you know, sociologically or anthropologically, I know the answer is I'm invested in one relationship and I want it to endure. The other one, not so much. Um, and also, perhaps my, my um, emotions in relation to the wrong are conditioned in, in all sorts of um, more or less subtle ways through culture and structure. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that later. So mostly, my point is, when, when wrongs occur between people, we mostly pursue the resolution through conversation and cooperation. That's actually the way that we handle most wrongs. But in relation to serious wrongs, serious criminal wrongs, what we have is a system of compulsion and constraint. And there's a problem with compulsion and constraint. If the, if the remedy is a restored relationship, but the, the root to the remedy is through compulsion and constraint, then what we're saying is that um, force, and in fact, I would go further and say violence, is now in play. Um, in the criminal justice system, we would think of that conventionally as legitimated violence. Um, the state is entitled, and I'm, I mean this in a kind of almost literal sense, the state's agent is entitled to lift the offender bodily and put them in the back of a van and take them to a place and lock them away. That's violence. Um, it's not violence in the sense of beating anybody up, but it's a violent um, uh, interference with the liberty and autonomy of the subjects. And even lesser sanctions or sanctions that we would generally judge to be lesser, like supervision, like probation or parole, that's suspended violence because what lies behind it is that threat, um, that if you don't comply with what is being um, compulsorily required of you, then the state is entitled to act on your body in that way. 
um, and will do so, which is no basis for a conversation. If you see what I mean, we don't usually feel well disposed to get into conversations with people who are exercising coercive control over you because that feels like um, like an abuse of your personhood, like a refusal to engage with you as a dignified subject. So that's a problem for reintegrative momentum. If we're trying to restore relationships and we're having to do it, and I'm not arguing against this here, if we're doing it through compulsion and constraint, then the path that we're taking is a difficult path. That's all I'm saying. Um, and that's another good reason for being highly parsimonious and restrained in the use of those powers. There are a few points. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the one-to-one -one relational situation, um, the person whose action is viewed by the other as uh, unacceptable, I think it would be quite important to check in with the person for the reality of what's unacceptable. We can't just view it through the lens of our own perception. Mm -hmm. So someone might be acting in a way that you find unacceptable, but they might find it as yeah. perfectly acceptable. Yeah. And I think the same applies at a wider social level. Mm -hmm. The whole business of reintegration, I mean, someone might, um, for example, uh, be less about um, you know, the focusing on the personal atomic individual mm -hmm. and more on society. Yep. Because they may view that there's, for example, normalized violence in society, mm -hmm. that society itself has certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So to place um, responsibility on individuals mm -hmm. and to integrate them back into a society which they may view as normalizing things they don't agree with, mm -hmm. then um, so I think it's again important to check in. Well, yeah. they may be in, they may be acting that way because they might fundamentally disagree with certain aspects of society. Yeah, I I agree, um, and you could argue that's one reason why we need uh, some sort of process of fair arbitration, um, which is in fact what a court system is intended to provide, because we we can take. Um, Legitimate, legitimately different perspectives on um, on questions of values and conduct within the constraints of a system of law which might bind us both. Um, and certainly the meaning of acts, the significance of acts, the extent of harms, all of those things are things that we might reasonably disagree about. Um, but at the level of interpersonal um, mediation, to draw on your experience, I guess it's 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 critically important to take the time to uh, explore the meaning of what happened for the different parties involved and to uh, to explore the possibility of arriving at some, if not a shared understanding, then a shared understanding of the two different understandings, if you, if you follow my logic. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is enough to help us move beyond what happened. Um, my problem is that when we go to that system of constraint and compulsion, actually what we're doing is silencing one of the parties in the conflict and saying, you're no, you're no longer a, a participant in a dialogue about this wrong. You are, um, you're being told, you're being told, to use a Scottish <laughs> expression, what this means, what it was, and what has to happen next. So. Let me just kind of roll on, because a lot of what you're raising in your questions is going to come together quite nicely, I think, as we get to the, as we get to the end in, a, in not too long. So we're at the point in, in the kind of logic here where compulsion and constraint create problems, but sometimes we have to use, or we may feel that we have to use those uh, to respond to serious wrongs, particularly if we have a, like an intransigent person who's done the wrong and isn't prepared to apologize or even engage. Um, so then we, we confront a choice about whether we use that negative power or positive power that I mentioned earlier. So the negative power, I, 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 I kind of discuss this metaphorically as a slicing off. And this is often the way that we think of retribution. Um, so in order to restore the balance, you've, you've, you've seized an unfair advantage which 
breaches the social contract. So now we're going to have to slice something off from you um, that, that, that remedies the imbalance. We're going to impose harm at the most extreme in some societies that would mean taking away life. In our um, Scottish context, it would mean taking away liberty uh, in somewhat intermediate levels. It might mean taking away time or demanding effort. Think about community service or payback. It might mean taking away money in the form of a fine or, a, or compensation. It might mean taking away some element of a person's worth or civic standing or status. That's what conviction does. Um, so there are, there are all sorts of negative exercises of sanctioning power. The problem, of course, is that all of them do damage to the capacity of the person whose reintegration we are fundamentally invested in. So we are kind of, we're now adding to compulsion and constraint incapacitation or, or a, a disabling effect of the harms that we're imposing. So our, our, our exemplar of disintegrative punishment is America at the moment, most, uh, including most American colleagues would agree. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to read to you from David Garland here, summing up this problem. So he says, in all societies, the stigma of criminal convictions and sentences of imprisonment creates difficulties for ex-offenders when they try to secure employment, find housing, form relationships, or resettle in the outside world. But in the United States, these de facto social consequences, these uh, real factual social consequences of conviction are exacerbated by a set of de jure or principle legal consequences that extend and intensify the sanction in multiple ways. Disenfranchisement, either temporary or permanent disqualification from public office or jury service, ineligibility for federal housing benefits, education benefits, welfare assistance, liability to court costs and prison fees, exclusion from various licensed occupations, banishment from specific urban areas, and where the offender is a non-citizen, deportation. All of these are concomitants of a criminal conviction for millions of individuals. The result is that potential employers, landlords and others are legally permitted to discriminate against an individual on the basis of his or her prior convictions, or even on the basis of prior arrests, even when these were for minor offences or offences that occurred many years previously. So it's, it's the polar opposite of reintegrative momentum. It's a momentum towards permanent exclusion in that context. And I'm not suggesting that we are um, doing a particularly excellent job of reintegration here. So then, what might we do in, in a sanctioning system that actually does generate reintegrative momentum? What might accelerate that process? And here you could think about using power in positive ways to elicit good from people. So the positive forms of reparation that might be, in fact, life enhancing for them and for, for those who, to whom they are making repair. You could think about this as a way of developing people's capacity to exercise their liberty positively. You could think about it in relation to the constructive use of time and work. You could think about it as finding a way to work for the enhancement of worth and the compensation of loss. And the way that I put these sets of possibilities together in a single model is to say that, okay, we have the notion of sanctions as providing redress for, for these breaches of reciprocal social relations. We can go down two tracks. Most of the time, certainly in our personal lives and in dealing with non-criminal wrongs, we take the reparative track. We invite voluntary contributions like apology, like taking seriously the wrong, paying attention thoughtfully, empathically to the suffering that you might have caused, maybe finding a way to make re make reparation for that, or just demonstrating in some way the sincerity of our apology by going out of our way to be kind to that person or to, to show that we feel indebted to them because of the harm that we've caused. And with sufficient demonstration of, of that attitude and disposition, we are reintegrated through that track. In that track, rehabilitation plays a role, but mostly its function is to enable us to make reparation. So, for example, if my interpersonal wrong is that I 
let's say in the context of employment, that um, it comes to light that I have been employing an unconscious bias in hiring decisions or in promotion decisions, then the right reaction to that, first of all, is for me to acknowledge it, apologize for it. But then the other thing that I do is go on some training to understand my unconscious bias better and to practice my decision making differently in the future. That's rehabilitation. That's me being prepared to act better in the future. The other track, the negative track, is retribution and the imposition of compulsory losses. But as I said before, even on that track, we have to care about rehabilitation because it's the route that gets us back to integration. So, I am, I'm going to finish just by talking about the four paths, four interwoven paths that take us towards reintegration. Um, and this is based on a model which has evolved from empirical research looking at how people do make it back. Um, so it's kind of examining the road to reintegration and then uh, discerning the elements that, that facilitate that journey. And these four tracks I've called personal rehabilitation, social rehabilitation, judicial rehabilitation and moral and political rehabilitation. To think about them by analogy, if we think about reintegration as a journey, personal rehabilitation is about the traveler. What, what is it that they need? Uh, what skill or aptitude or fitness do they have to develop to be uh, fit for the journey? Judicial rehabilitation is like passport control. What is the certification um, uh, that, that guarantees them passage? Social rehabilitation is about the companions that we travel with or that we meet along the way, the climate that we travel in, the welcome that we receive. And moral and political rehabilitation is about the dialogue uh, that we engage in along the way and also about where we finally arrive. So the traveler, first of all, may need some sense of redevelopment of themselves. There may be some issue of human potential, we were talking about education earlier, or human capital, or uh, a shift in motivation, the acquisition of new skills. More generally, the evidence here suggests that there can also be important changes in narrative and identity, a sense of who we are, where we're going, what we believe in. So all of these are sort of intrinsic to the individual who is returning and their kind of disposition to their own return or their fitness for their own return. And I would characterize these as being linked to projects of self-development and the importance of self-recognition of one's own identity as a returning citizen, for want of a better expression. The passport control, judicial rehabilitation, is about the re-qualification of the juridical subject. That's old language from Beccaria again, meaning that you are restored in your rights that you are formally and fully de-labeled, so you're no longer a criminal or an offender, not even an ex-offender or an ex-criminal. That involves status elevation and restoration, some kind of process that brings the person uh, fully back into equal citizenship. And I, I argue that that's a responsibility of the, the punishing state to bring punishment to an end. Um, and a function for our courts. So that's about formal systemic recognition of restored status. Social rehabilitation is about companions and climate. So this is not about whether the law says that I'm back, but rather about whether you accept me back and on what terms. Uh, do you realize, do you recognize, do you accept me um, as a neighbor, um, as a fellow citizen, as a member of the club or the association. And that's about social status, social connection, social capital, social resources. And actually it confers responsibilities on all of us, the receiving community, on whose behalf punishment has been exercised. We're not entitled to be passive in that process. We are obliged to be active recipients of people who are returning. Um, so that's about social recognition. And then lastly, the, the, the question of dialogue, and this returns us to your point about um, 
the existence of prior injustices and the significance of inequalities in, in this project. So if, if we're thinking only at the level of the act for which redress has been provided, then we're in the territory of mediation. We're in the territory of victims, communities and offenders getting together um, and figuring out what redress has been provided and how it uh, satisfies um, the victim's legitimate interests. But as, as I'm sure you'll have been aware um, from your practice experience and as you, you raised in relation to the, the objection about um, Indigenous people or um, ethnic minorities who are over-policed and over-penalised, if there's a prior injustice, um, then it can certainly be argued, I think, that the state is complicit and bears responsibility for this offence too. Uh, so if I'm a former child in care um, whose offending is driven by drug use, which is driven by trauma, for which the state bears some responsibility, then I am. I may be responsible for my actions, and I, I wouldn't necessarily argue against that. And except in extreme, you know, in extreme cases where the distress or the um, compulsion was so significant that there really was uh, very little choice taking place. But I don't need that level of compulsion to make an argument that there's collective responsibility in play here. And the collective responsibility really is collective. If a significant part of the conditions that produced the original trauma was related to material inequalities that are the result, for example, of the electorate not choosing to support parties that were prepared to tax at a level that would have addressed the social inequalities that created the conditions that generated the trauma that led to the addiction. So you, you go back up the causal chain far enough, you find that accountability for offending is shared. And so I argue that the dialogue on the destination is about redress flowing in all directions um, to different degrees in different scenarios. So for Indigenous people, uh, there, there are sort of uh, post-colonial debts that have to be weighed in uh, and, and should be weighed into the equation here. And so when we're talking about the relational restoration of bonds between citizens, civil society and state, there are duties across all of those. One sort of slight caveat or diversion here, but an important one for me is that this is also why enfranchisement is so important in the context of uh, punishment. If a person is formally disenfranchised, what that says is that they're not entitled to speak politically. And if a person is not entitled to speak, then they can't be a participant in a dialogue. And in that context, rehabilitative efforts can only be authoritarian and monological or pedagogical. They're a lecture, they're not a conversation. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very supportive of enfranchisement. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to finish just by sort of leaving you with a kind of metaphor for what I've been trying to talk about. Um, and the metaphor is to go back to the argument about what has fundamentally caused offence is that someone has acted in such a way that there is a tear in the social fabric. So um, we've been relying on the completeness of a system of mutual recognition and respect and something has happened which has ripped that. That may be a large tear or a small tear, it doesn't actually matter. Um, a, lot, a small one can become a large one if it's left unattended. So there's a tear. But you don't fix a tear by working on one side of it. And most of the time in our criminal justice system, that's what we do. We basically say the offender has to rehabilitate themselves or be rehabilitated to be fit for reinsertion. That isn't relational repair. Um, and it can't possibly fix a tear in the social fabric. So I argue that the tear and the repair are both relational between the people involved, between civil society, citizen and state, and that we need mutual recognition to characterize the way that we repair 
the tear. Um, social structures and cultures, and that's some of where we were getting to with those those final thoughts, shape the relational possibilities. And if we if we live in societies that are profoundly unjust, atomized, repressive, punitive, um, stigmatizing in their response to difference, then we're in some difficulty. But however hard that is, we don't really have any choice but to work at fixing the tear. And in relation to that task, all I would say to finish is that, again, to extend the metaphor, the needle hurts, but the thread binds. And it's better to live with a scar than an open wound. <laughs> so, that was about an hour of uh, <laughs> me waffling around uh, with some very useful interventions and questions. But I don't know where you would like to take the conversation next. I didn't, apart from you know, the beginning, I didn't attend very specifically to the questions of faith but or spirituality, but I think they're very much implicit. I was thinking even today about the idea of uh, reconciliation. I was thinking about atonement. I can think about repentance um, in connection with the question of apology and sincerity. You can think about penitence in that context. There's lots of ideas that might have some bearing, and that's just from my particular tradition. I don't know from other faith traditions what sorts of ideas might resonate or um, extend or, or indeed contradict some of these ways of thinking that I've been drawing from, from philosophy mostly. Um, well, one approach would be that from a sort of more spiritual perspective, you might start from a sort of basis of the fundamental dignity of humanity, mm -hmm. and that might lead one to a view to be opposed to, say, capital punishment. Mm -hmm. So one might take a, you know, quite a strong view about an action, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, one might want to protect the dignity of the yeah. person yeah. behind that action. Yeah. So that would be one way in which it would cut across some of this. Yeah. Um, going back to the point with earlier, which I think you, you came round to a bit, this aspect that um, you know, someone might legitimately feel that there's certain things normalised in society, mm -hmm. which they legitimately feel they have to um, raise their conscience in relationship to. So in a sense, for them, they're not wanting to be reintegrated back into what they see as, a, as, a, as an unjust situation. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so there's that aspect too. I also feel this reciprocal aspect. I feel many people in society don't really feel they have much agency in a reciprocal relation. Yeah. It's, it's more of a, like an imposed yeah. value framework or an yeah. imposed set of norms. Yeah. So, um, and I think you see that almost at the level of Scotland as a country. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of communities too, I think certain things feel imposed yep. rather than meaningfully relational in a mutually respectful yep. sense. I think that's definitely lacking yep. in, in many ways. So, yep. so I think there, that sort of complicates it that um, I don't think we can assume that this reciprocity, yep. because I feel, and I'm, I'm sure many people will feel that they don't have access to that, yep. they, they haven't. Yeah, um, part of how that's been set up. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And uh, again, that's, that's the difficulty of kind of starting with a fiction, like a the liberal fiction, and then trying to think through its implications um, without necessarily attending to what what might bring that into into being or make it more real for people. So the um, what what you just described sounds exactly like living in a situation where we feel coerced and constrained by forces beyond our control a lot of the time, um, not just in relation to the exercise of penal power to, in response to criminal wrongs or criminalized wrongs, but um, in, in a more generalized sense. Interestingly, your point about um, human dignity is one that Durkheim anticipated. He argued that at, this was a, at the turn of the 20th century, but he argued that with with kind of religious um, 
the, the, the sense that, are, that the values that were being violated were sacred. Uh, with that moving um, kind of into history, he thought um, moral individualism would be the force that would drive uh, the sense of the sacred. So then, it, uh, but what he expected was that we would apply that on both sides of the offender victim dyad. So just in the same way that we would be rightly appalled at the suffering of the victim, we would also find it intolerable to imagine doing certain things to the offender, certain sort of pre-modern things like corporal punishment or capital punishment, and that that would drive us towards what he called restitutive justice, which is very linked to the kind of reparative ideas that I've been describing. Or just restitutive, so restitution. Yeah. To make restitution rather than to repress through violence, which is what he he felt characterised the. Um, the kind of pre-enlightenment approach to punishment, sort of more brutal uh, corporal and capital punishments. But he was wrong. You know, his, his vision of, of sort of social progress through modernity towards restitutive justice, even he noticed it himself before he died. He was, he was depressed by how then at the end of the 20th, at the 19th century, the forms of restitutive justice that he expected weren't emerging and what was emerging and becoming the sort of default mode of punishment was the prison, and he kind of he was troubled by that. Um, so, yes, it's, it's interesting. I, I I find his kind of there's an awful lot in his sociology of punishment which I find very compelling. But um, what I find so interesting is that we've gone backwards from <laughs> the kind of position that he imagined towards more repressive and more punitive responses um, and even to, to begin to celebrate celebrate um, practices that a generation ago we would have found abhorrent. Um, I think it's there's so much obvious injustice I think and um, it underpins a criminal justice system just the fact of who winds up in prison mm. it's, it's poor it's people with people with colour in their skin, predominantly. If you get someone, I used to meet people who would get charged and sent to prison because they had overclaimed deliberately or accidentally maybe mm -hmm. social security money, yeah. and it would be a total pit pittance. Yeah. And yet people can use mm -hmm. offshore accounts yeah. to avoid tax, yeah. um, you know, they spend billions on nuclear weapons, but they can't provide decent yeah. care to people. Yeah. These are the kinds of things that I feel focusing on some of the small misdemeanors that people do seem to be, you know, just missing the point. Um, I think that's a sign that there isn't actually, from the upper echelons of society, there's no intention to care. Well, I think that, that yeah, honest. and that, that's a very, again, I, I think that that's exactly right. and and also deeply troubling. Like, uh, on one level, I would argue that the law has always favoured uh, the property-owning classes and that, you know, any Marxist um, worth or so, I'm not saying I'm a Marxist, but any Marxist would have, would have made that argument for, for a couple of centuries, almost now. Um, but the point now is that it's so, you know, 50 years ago, people would have believed that the system wasn't rigged in that sense. Maybe it was rigged, yeah. but the, it would have had a sense of uh, legitimacy at that point. Now, it seems to me, and, and this could be a good thing or a bad thing, it seems to be more out in the open that uh, the kind of inequalities in terms of what and who is criminalised and with what effect yeah. Yeah. Is, is so much more apparent that it undermines the legitimacy of the whole legal system. And on one level, you could say that might be good in the sense that it might um, provoke uh, a crisis of legitimacy that drives more significant social change, political change. On the other hand, it could leave us in a, in a, in a situation where there's uh, really very little respect for the law in the round, uh, which could be the, you know, could produce um, significant uh, difficulties in relation to social disorder. Um, and I don't just mean for white middle-class men, uh, I mean for, all, for everybody, uh, that could be... And you get troubling. cynicism 
for yeah. instance, we're all suffering austerity. Well, yeah. some people far more than I am, but for the bankers, you know, yeah. just basically well, there's, we're there's, thieves. There's that. There's the MPs' expenses scandal. There's, yeah. you know, there's there's endless examples. The tax evasion avoidance stuff. This this was sort of driven home to me particularly forcefully when I was watching an episode of Question Time, and it was just after. I'll just, since we're being recorded, I won't name names for fear of libel, but it was just after a famous singer from a boy band, no longer a boy, had um, had, had a case against him which uh, he lost uh, to the tune of several million pounds. Um, and, and what I, there was a question asked of the politicians and um, some of them responded with a kind of... Uh, what you would expect, or at least what I expected, which was a defence of the principle that we should all pay our taxes, our fair share, um, relative to what we were earning, and that to seek to avoid that through schemes and loopholes was was a kind of a, a moral problem. It's yeah, but that the, the problem for me was that the audience reaction seemed principally to be, well, you know, if, if you're if you're clever enough and you can afford a good enough lawyer to get you out of it then we would all do that wouldn't we yeah that's, and, and that really that's worried me yeah. um yeah. because it, it it sort of signaled almost an acceptance of the idea that if you can get yourself out of your obligations you should or at least you can, you can. Um, you can and don't get uh, caught yeah right but of those rich people not of the people who are scheming off um you know uh, getting their benefits or you know so again it's the judgment of those that could would but if you judged the people judge to be taken so part of that class. Mm. yeah and i was get what that's going to say one one point i was going to make is we're about to see the i think saturday there's going to be in edinburgh and different cities um the extinction gorillas mm -hmm. and they say it's we will be arrested because we're going to it's serious enough with climate change, we are going to um, block roads and cause disorder, mm -hmm. public disorder. And that's an interesting development. Mm -hmm. But the other point I was going to make was about our assumption that identity is based on inclusion. Mm -hmm. And maybe, well, we see this with teenagers, being other. Yeah. Defining yourself as other yeah. is an important, maybe developmental step, but it also might be an existential reality that people don't want to be part of the society for whatever reason. Well, that, that was something you'd also said, which I meant to get back to, which uh, uh, is really important that there's a kind of implicit assumption, that, again, in the liberal myth, that, um, that there is a social contract that we're all signed up to, in theory. Mm. Uh, and of course, that's that's an idea which is under uh, it, it was always a fiction but even as a fiction it's under more and more intense pressure as uh, diversity uh, um, and disparity in views about what is a good life um, evolves the philosophers interestingly um, and and moral psychologists argue about that though there's there's some work which suggests that for all that we frame our, our core beliefs in different ways uh, some argue that there are fundamentally common values held across cultural groups and different traditions. Jonathan Haidt is an American philosopher who's written a great deal about this, partly in an effort to understand the differences in his context between progressives and conservatives in American politics and what it is that they agree about yeah. and what it is that they disagree about. And I can't remember the details of this. I just remember that he finds five or six core beliefs that the progressives and the conservatives share, the thing is that they don't prioritize them the same. Mm. So the one I remember always is that conservatives prize purity, purity, which purity as a cultural value, we all do. We all care about preserving in a kind of pure condition things that we regard as um, uh, of, of profound value, whatever that is. And he's not, I can't remember in, in precisely which specific context he's talking about it. But as long as he's not talking about race. Well, mm. it, it, 
it's corrupted. It can be corrupted into that. It can also be corrupted in lots of other ways. But purity as a kind of the idea that that things that we hold good should be held good, you know, should not be kind of. But what um, about diversity? And well, but that the, so the liberals. Values. Yeah. Just meaning values. Isn't it? Well, things that you. Do. I, I don't. I need to go back and read it. My point, simple point, was that they prize purity highly. The liberals prize individual freedom. The progressives, sorry, would prize individual freedom very highly. The conservatives will trump freedom for purity. The liberals will trump purity for freedom. So the, the, the contest is over not having fundamentally different values, but having different priorities yeah. um, among values and different weightings. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just one. Um, he's a moral psychologist and a philosopher who, who takes a particular view um, and I, I don't know enough about about that specific field to to say where the evidence stands. I think cultural diversity and uh, I I I would see that as as something that should be a cause of celebration um, and ought to be enriching. But it depends in, in order for us to kind of uh, live in more complex social groups, which are. Uh, which are characterised by difference, um, the attention that we pay to the dialogue and the conversation needs to be intensified uh, because less can be taken for granted. Whereas that pressure or, or, or the need for that is has come at the same time as we've withdrawn the resources that would enable that sort of intercultural, interfaith dialogue to to. To, to, to take place in ways which actually foster um, collective efficacy across diverse social groups. But sorry, I'm trying to. Yeah, I mean, both at the one to one relational level and the social level, um, like I said, if, if, if I feel I've agreed something with someone, say an ethical agreement, and they seem to act in a way that is contrary to that, I would certainly want to check in to see if we also understand the rights in that way. Mm -hmm. But I would also be open to, you know, what are the learnings for me yeah. in the situation? It's not just about uh, viewing them or their action as bad in some sense. Yeah. And again, the same social way, um, like people who are, who feel that they're legitimately campaigning against aspects of society they disagree with, mm -hmm. then I feel the model needs to include ways in which society itself can be open to its own limitations, its own yeah. shortcomings, yeah. and to learn from yeah. those protests, rather than just criminalizing those protests, yeah. but to be open to the uh, actual maybe insights for society that society needs to learn from. Yeah. So how, how the model can, both the individual relational and the social model, yeah. can, can incorporate that. Go back to the question of you know your example of someone you love. Again, I would the question for me would be well, what is the nature of your love mm -hmm. for the person? Um, does it uh, does it transcend an action you disagree with, or is it fundamentally bound up with a perception that they have to act in a certain way? Mm -hmm. So I think there's you know again I would be kind of looking behind, and it would also be a mirror back to me. Well. Yeah. How do I understand yeah. love and relationality yeah. if I'm so focused on action? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, I think there's a lot. Rather than just uh, start from a perspective that someone has, someone's action is, mm -hmm. um, you know, is unjust, however we want to call it. I think there's a lot for ourselves and for society to grapple with, yeah. too, and how the model can incorporate that. Yeah. You remind me of a, it's a great quote. Um, this is from today's class as well, where uh, in America, there's a new abolitionist movement uh, linked to Black Lives Matter, um, which is essentially about uh, poor communities of color, where people feel they cannot rely on the, the police or the courts as a way to address wrongs um, developing um, processes of accountability, relational accountability, and um, in in the community and at the, at the neighbourhood level, and one of the one of the questions that that is asked in that context is, 
what is it that did I say this already earlier, or is this my previous? It's quite funny when you've given several talks and one day you forget who you said what to. But um, the, the phrase is about the police inside our head. Um, and it, what it's trying to get at is what is it that makes us think that, that an event or an action requires that as the kind of natural reaction? You know, why, why, in relation to which events? or actions or conflicts involving which actors do we go to that response? Um, that's a very good question because, you know, as soon as you stop to think about it, you can think of lots of examples of situations where, uh, well, for example, young people in care um, are highly vulnerable to acquiring criminal records for doing things that in the context of a family home would be managed by parents, um, not without difficulty, yeah. and we've all been there, well, many of us have, um, but they would, you wouldn't dream of calling the police um, to deal with your kind of truculent teenager um, damaging property, for example, in your house. Very unlikely that you would go to the police as the remedy for that event, but if it happens in a children's home, then it, it becomes a policeable action. Um, and more generally, you know, you could think about examples of young people on the streets um, with the curtain twitcher. If you look out at, and you look, and you recognise those children as being the sort of children that should be in your street, which could be a, a, a classed or a racialized judgment, then either you let it go or you you intervene yourself. Whereas if you if you recognise a form of difference that invites the police in your head, then that 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 leads to an action which is policed and potentially prosecuted in a different way. So the, the, um, the question that's being asked in this movement is what's driving the police in our head and, and what do we do about that? Uh, why don't we own the, the conflicts that, that, that we're experiencing um, and, and maybe think about them more in the kind of more fully relational way that you're articulating, which is not just in, not just as a kind of action which breaches a relational connection but rather as a an event which asks us questions about ourselves and and others um and society yeah yeah but also like for example someone might be um, someone who sort of casually throws out racist hate speech mm -hmm. yeah so i would be interested though you know how has that person come to be that mm -hmm. way? Yeah. What is the social reality that that person yeah. has experienced that's led them to be that way? Yeah. Uh, so rather than just, in a sense, pointing their finger at that atomic individual, mm -hmm. I feel society has yeah. arguable responsibility to inquire yeah. how that person has come to be that way. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so in terms of you know, reintegration, if, if that exploration isn't that then, uh, like, like you've described, it, it could actually not really, possibly even unconscious levels, might not get to those levels mm -hmm. where that person has been yeah. touched or wounded or unconscious yeah. trauma, whatever it might be. Yeah. So, um, in which case, what you might have, even at best, is a person who has kind of internalized that, um, whatever that was that drove that, suppressed it in order to be compliant, but actually the, 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 the more fundamental issue is unresolved, which is liable to create a vulnerability to, um, I for, for that to research. You know, I think a lot about the response that we make, governments in this war against terrorism, which is, you know, becoming more and more surveillance and people getting interviewed by MI16 and things like that. And I saw something a week ago, a couple of videos of people who'd been interviewed and it was, it was completely appalling mm -hmm. the way that they were treated. And they were actually, hadn't done anything. They were just suspects because they have lots of criteria by which you could be a suspect. Yeah. And um, it seems obvious to me if someone has actually committed a terrorist act that you would say, well, what is the meaning of their behavior? What lies behind that? Yeah. It's got to be grievance, hasn't it, of some yeah. sort? But there's never, I don't feel, any attempt 
to ask those questions so that we could better deal yeah. with the gr very legitimate grievances, I feel, that yeah. many people who've come here from the Middle East must have. Yes. And I think that the attitudes now are becoming more prevalent is that people who ask questions like yours, you know, what is that person's motivation, um, are seen as somehow reprehensible themselves yeah. because they're seen as somehow yeah. defending the crime. You know, and, and you, you get, it's almost become an environment now where you can't even ask those questions anymore, which is quite frightening, really, to me. Which, yeah. Who was it that said, we need a, a, little, a little less understanding and a little more condemnation? Hmm. I think that was, was that John Major or? <laughs> yeah, it's one of them. Well, yeah. Dad, I'm just interested in the, in the cultural climate, really, mm -hmm. um, and how you've experienced this, because you've indicated that the sort of punitive, retributive aspect, it seems to be on the increase. I seem yeah. to see that in the media and yeah. sort of documentaries I've watched on TV. And, um, you know, is that really helpful? And no. It's, it's, it's not, is it? It's profoundly unhelpful. It's counterproductive. But it's, it's the sociologists of punishment um, and who, who, who study that argue that there's no sort of settled consensus on it. But in broad terms, the, the argument is that we've, we've created for ourselves a less secure society. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense in which uh, at one point, rising crime rates were part of the driver of that insecurity. So in the post-war era, we expected the welfare state and the, the, the sort of collective protection in which we were investing to to produce um, peace and tranquility and, and falling crime, and it didn't. And so faith in, in the welfareist project waned. And instead, we got um, neoliberalism. So we have market deregulation, um, less uh, protections for people in, in the workforce. At the same time, we have um, a kind of decline in the certainties that were once associated with religion or with political ideologies. People kind of lose faith in both senses. And um, they also lose faith in experts, in science, in progress, and all of those ideas. So you get what um, Anthony Giddens calls ontological insecurity, which mm -hmm. is to be insecure about the very nature of our being. Mm -hmm. um, and we're insecure in the labour market, we're insecure financially, we're insecure in, in multiple ways at once. And the, the consequence of that, so the argument goes, is precisely the atomization and individualization and self-protection that, that, that's generated. So it's a kind of ultra-individualistic um, effect which atrophies, uh, damages social bonds, weakens community ties. Uh, we ensure ourselves against risks. We don't look after each other. You um, just have solidarity. Yeah. yeah. So you can yeah. yeah. workforce. Exactly. So you get the minute. Counter, yeah. counter these trends, I think, yeah. by taking care of people around you. Yeah. So you get a week. At the, at the same time, there's an argument about the, the state chooses that path economically um, and then when you when you pull back from the welfare provision you have to strengthen the penal system because that's that's where you mop up so you get less welfare more punishment um, in, in simple terms as the price that's paid for um, essentially a much more selfish um, and individualistic society um, and, and then along with that comes um, othering, you know, the kind of separation of mm -hmm. people into classes, groups, yeah. uh, categories, species even, like the, the notion of sort of subspecies, um, like the, uh, the, 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 the cockroach migrant, yeah. that, that yeah. kind of horrible yeah. language, which is basically signifying it's just cr finding crushable. Well, Judith Butler has this lovely, um, lovely, uh, but also agonizing expression for it, which is she, she tries to understand how it, how it is that some lives are grievable lives and some lives are not. Yeah. So what, what's mm -hmm. happening that is allowing us to construct certain lives as grievable or not grievable? And, um, and I think that's a, that's a very kind of... Why aren't we getting angry? Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, I, actually, I actually think that those social processes also... Um, weaken 
the resistance because they make us all feel vulnerable and isolated um, and they kind of under, undermine even the collectivization of opposition. Um, so that's probably possibly part of it. We're also exhausted, distracted. We were talking about this earlier. You know, we're running around in circles, chasing our tails, uh, consuming our times and energies and resources in uh, largely fruitless pursuits. Mm -hmm. We're kind of distracting ourselves to death. Um, you could argue so. And it's hard to know what to do that would be effective. Also, yeah, I find you know, you know to step to it. I'm sitting yeah. here like, well, there I mean, must I'm be going on <laughs> march on Saturday, anti-racism, <laughs> but I kind of feel what difference is it going to make, you know, you know. But except, I tell myself, you should stand up and be counted in a public space, you know, against racism. Yeah. That's one question. Yeah. Well, I um, think. I mean, I. I Again, I, I, I think that the answers are old answers. Like there's, a, there's consciousness raising, there's collectivization, there are small changes, there's individual steps, there's, there's justice, the pursuit of justice at every level from the way that we relate to um, the individuals whose lives we're most connected with right, right through to the global questions of justice. And, and then um, how do we order our lives in ways which, um, are sustainable and uh, and diminish the the kind of waste and uh, by, by waste here I'm not talking about the environmental destruction I'm talking about the waste of us yeah. as an ecology uh, that could flourish um, but which actually most of the time we 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 self pollute um, maybe sorry. So I mean, I, I photograph most of the marches and protests in Scotland, so I, I really observe a lot of the dynamics around them. One thing I feel is that um, I feel more people need to invest in causes where they perceive that they're not an immediate beneficiary. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of people are motivated to protest about things if it is immediate to them, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's going to be enough. Mm -hmm. I think people need to have a much wider social sense mm -hmm. in terms of the issues that they're willing to invest in. So um, I consistently, this issue comes up consistently when I observe a lot of the mm -hmm. protests and, mm -hmm. and social movements. So how we can, how society can motivate people to have this wider mm -hmm. investment I think is, a, is a challenge. Like more people should be here tonight to hear about prisons. Really, yeah. it's, it's an important issue. Well, I think one one part of that might be um, thinking about how to propagate the seeds of empathy. Like if, if you're trying to look beyond uh, even an enlightened self-interest, um, or politics of enlightened self-interest, then um, one way to, to do that and one way to counteract the othering um, that, that we just talked about is, is through um, deliberate strategies that, that are about the generation of empathy. And I, I think in that connection, different strand of my work, but um, narrative storytelling um, and culturally mediated um, ways of connecting people whose experiences are disparate are, is profoundly important. So a little advert, um, I, I, I'm involved in another project called Distant Voices, um, Coming Home which is a, a project that uses uh, songwriting in Scottish criminal justice in and around with uh, people who are in prison or on community sentences, families, um, victims, people who work in the system, people who study the system, working with Scottish musicians to write songs that explore aspects of our experiences. And then we take the songs into public fora, everything from very small house gigs to very large public events and we have we've got a headline slot in the Celtic Connections Festival oh. um, on the 31st of January um, at the QM Union which is on the University of Glasgow's campus um, where we'll be performing um, not we I won't be performing <laughs> the musicians will be performing um, songs from that project um, as, as a, I mean I, I think of that as a kind of um, propagation of empathy it's just to kind of like here are lives that you don't hear about mediated in ways which are beautiful 
unaffecting. Uh, the songs don't tell you what to think about these lives or uh, how to even necessarily how to make sense of them. They just bring them into your consciousness in a way which is less easily um, ignored. Um, and there might be the beginning of, of something. And actually, I know there is because people who engage with that project and are, are moved and affected by those songs quite often do something about it. You know, they, they act. So right, we lead into our next event. Mm -hmm. Good. This Saturday in the Hill, we have a day conference on empathy education right. and education of the heart. Good. It's a it's a really excellent lineup. It's a very good group of. So, I mean that aspect of the empathy deficit. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's very much there with some politicians. Yeah. You know the policies they enact, but they're not empathising with the implications that that has for people. Yeah. That sounds like a good point to end. Um, I was going to tell you a very nice experience I had last week, which would be cheerful end. And I was asked by a young woman who she was collecting signatures to send a petition to the Home Office to enable refugees permission to work. You know how they come and they're not allowed to work, they're just given yeah. about 36 quid a week and yeah. supposed to survive. And so I, I, I signed it and then she said, you couldn't take it and you had it filled in. So I said, Okay, it seemed a small thing. I squats myself down in leaf, and within about 20 minutes, I had the sheet filled. I, I never got any crap from anybody about too many immigrants or anything. They totally understood yeah. that we need to care for refugees. Yeah. This, so there is empathy among people. There is. They were all total strangers I didn't know. I just waylaid them. <laughs> well, that is a good and happy ending. Small steps. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. And, uh, it was fascinating uh, to hear your kind of thoughts and reactions. So.